because my sister's life was on the line, I really made it a big part of my life to remember every single detail, every single medication, every single surgery. If I knew every number, if I knew every date, then this was all gonna be okay. This was gonna work out. That's the thing I can control. It wasn't even a thought process that this was gonna go poorly. We want to extend a huge thank you to Frida Mom and Dame for bringing this episode of What's Underneath Birth and Postpartum to Life. Stay tuned till the end of the episode to learn more about our incredible partners and the special offers they have for you. So can you begin by talking about how you're feeling right now? I feel quite nervous, actually. There's still an untangling I have to do with like the robot self. It sounds so simple, but just saying how I'm actually feeling is very new. I knew coming in here, any sort of filter that I maybe subconsciously planned, I'm not bringing it in. So can you talk a little bit about what your style says about you? There's something that makes me feel very empowered when I get to turn a typical men's suit into something that feels like me. Yeah, there's something about that that feels like taking the power back from like the men in suits in some way. I definitely grew up in the sort of the boys club of it. I was like, this is just how it is. This is how it is with being a woman in music. And when the Me Too movement happened, it truly changed my life. I, I fired everyone I worked with. And by the end of it, it was just my sister and I. <laughs> and part of the firing was just realizing I wasn't, I wasn't being surrounded by feminists at all. So can you talk about assumptions that people make about you based on how you appear? I would say it would probably be something around happiness. It's important for me to project positivity, but part of that projection is because I, I don't always have that inside. When I was sitting in the hospital with my sister, the idea of posting about a shoot that I had where I was pretending that I had it that day, but really I had just been on hour you know, 13 in the hospital. I just, I couldn't do it. I had to take a pause from music. I was doing like the caretaking full time and being an advocate for my sister. And then it reached a point where the doctor said, there's nothing more we can do. And so I asked my sister if I could post about it. Could I say, hey, we've just been told this. We want to know if there's any other options. It was a really important thing to do because no one knew what had been happening. There was a big turning point with being open about what was going on. Now there was no hiding. And that has been a big theme, I think, a consistent lesson that I'm facing. I planned a whole life with my sister. It didn't really matter who my partner was gonna be when it came to raising kids because she was gonna live next door to me. We were definitely more best friends than the sister dynamic, soulmate sort of energy. Mm -hmm. We had been working together for probably at that point over four and a half years. And then when the pandemic hit, she brought up something that was happening to her. And I said, you need to go to a doctor immediately. Days after her 30th birthday, it started snowballing. What did she have? What's her name? Ovarian cancer. Yeah. I feel like the turning point was just the, the chemo not working. And so then we started looking into different options. What were you feeling when this happened to her and what was happening to you? Well, I was in work mode. As the person that is sitting by their bedside, you keep going, you know? And my sister was really into manifestation. And so it wasn't even a thought process that this was gonna go poorly. If I knew every bit of information, every symptom down to a T, if I knew every number, if I knew every date, then this was all gonna be okay. This was gonna work out. That's the thing I can control. And it was such a honor for me to be able to do that because my 
sister could take a deep breath and know that I, I've got it. On Christmas day, I had to bring Kate back to the hospital. And then the next day, I was on the phone with one of her doctors and he was telling me about the condition that Kate was in. And I said, okay, well, what about this option? You know, he's kind of replying and I could hear his kids in the background because it's Christmas. And he said, well, that wouldn't work because of X, Y, and Z. And then I said, okay, what about this? I know we discussed this could be an option. And I'm, I, every single thing I'm, I'm saying, what about this? Well, I know we'd had discussed this, blah, blah. And it reached a point where he, he said, your sister is dying. You need to understand that. And uh, he kind of, you know, yelled it and he needed to, you know, yell it. And I just <laughs> fell to the ground. He started crying too. 20 minutes later, Kay was like, how did the call go with the doctor? I composed myself. I didn't want to scare her. Mm -hmm. And I just said, I think they're going to talk to you tomorrow morning about hospice stuff, but let's take it with a grain of salt. On my end, I'm going to look into other options, you know, but I wasn't going to lie to her. It, it really snowballed really fast, but still fighting, you know, still looking for other things. The whole time. Oh yeah. I remember after that phone call with the doctor, when I went to the hospital, I dipped my toe in and I just said, I really don't want to lose you. And she just looked at me and she said, you're giving up on me. And I was like, no, no, no. I just want you to know that, you know? And I like pulled out all the right. <laughs> options that I had set for her. I just mm -hmm. was like, I just want you to know that like, like I don't want that at all when it did reach a point where we were at the final stages, she went in to get this uh, tube put into her uh, esophagus. When they were rolling her away to go in to put in this uh, tube, we normally do this like very obnoxious thing where we were like, I love you, I love you, you know. Mm. I yelled out to her, you know, I love you. And she didn't say it and when I walked away, I just, I just knew. And then within about 10 minutes, the doctor came out and told me that she was being sent to the ICU. And this was, this was it. It was my mom, dad, and I with Kate. We were there when she passed away. And I was actually the one that found that she wasn't breathing. And the sort of like composed self that I had to be for my parents, that I had to be for the doctors, for Kate, for the nurses, when I could tell that she wasn't breathing. It's just like animalistic, you know? I recall being restrained. Yeah. After Kate passed away, I, I really didn't want to continue living. And then it reached a point where it was really intrusive thoughts about what that would look like. And I told my husband, uh, he said, you're not allowed to kill myself. Fortunately, it really made me laugh because I was like, I don't think you're supposed to say that. <laughs> but it reached a breaking point where I was like, I need to do something. With him knowing this information, then we came up with steps. The first thing was getting on antidepressants and just the placebo effect of taking something that I'm taking because I'm trying to like continue living. Mm -hmm. I all of a sudden like looked around and I was like, oh wow, I, you know, this place we live in is so beautiful. Never, we've been living there for months. 
had never taken in anything. Mm-hmm. And that's when I had the ability to then tap into seeing signs and I noticed sort of this pattern of wind, like wind coming at certain times. I always thought I wanted to be a mom. And after Kate passed away, I was like, maybe that's not in the cards for me. And I was telling one of my best friends about it and we were in Palm Springs and it was 11 a.m sun beaming down, dry, dry, dry. And I said, maybe I'm, I'm not ever gonna have kids. My best friend said, I just feel like that's something Kate would have loved for you to have. Just at that, there was this massive gust of wind and we both just like started crying, you know? When I played Coachella, I sang this song, the only song I've ever written about Kate. It is this song called High Water. And again, it was 4 p.m. We're now in Coachella Desert. And the only time there was wind was right when I finished that song. I underestimated how nice it is to feel connected to her in those moments. I ended up proposing to my husband. That's cool. And I didn't know, but at the time I was pregnant. It really feels like a gift because she, it's something she knew about me. It's not something I really talk about with a lot of people, but it's just something she knew about me. (sighs) When do you feel the most vulnerable? I think it would be asking for help, admitting that I'm not okay. Like even that conversation that I told you that my husband and I had, it didn't start by me saying, hey, so I need your help. This is how I'm feeling. No, it started with me saying, I feel like I can't Mm -hmm. really voice how I'm feeling. You feel as though you're not serving anyone around you. So you might as well not be there. That's Mm -hmm. what you really feel. Mm -hmm. You just are like, I'm not giving anything to anyone. And then you're going to ask them for help. Like, no, you feel as though, oh gosh, I've been just this, you know, ghost of myself hanging around. By the way, when, when a friend comes to me, you know, and they, they are feeling really down or whatever, Oh, I would move mountains. Yeah. Yeah. When do you feel the most beautiful? When I'm making someone else laugh. Like if I've, if I've set up a bit in my head and I'm retelling a story or something silly that's happened, because I feel very seen when someone's laughing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is the greatest gift that Kate gave you? I think it would be experiencing someone where their only intentions are pure like the way she would like look at the world that positivity she would exude there was no limits to it i think it was also a gift that she gave me to know my capacity for love i think it will be part of my journey to be that in love and something that i'm excited about with little baby because I know that's gonna be my vibe, of course, right. of just you know so much love. Why in your body, in your journey, in your skin, why is it a good place to be? It's a good place to be now because I, I, I experienced hell. And I still have a bitterness about it, so I don't wanna say mm-hmm. you know that changed mm-hmm. me and it's for the better, not like that. Mm-hmm. I just mean, there's something about going through that that it tells you what's real and what's not. What can you say to me right now that can hurt me on the level that I have been hurt? There's a purposeful effort in my body and in my life now to not hide. A big thing that I really, really want to say is love hard. There could always be things that you, things you wouldn't even think of that you may regret or whatever. But if it's someone that you trust and you love, it's like, don't hold yourself back Mm. for fear of losing them. Because I'm so glad that we just stuck it out, that we just continued Mm. our friendship, we continued our laughter. Like, I'm so glad that I told her every single day how much I love her. That is an amazing message for everybody. That is amazing. (sighs) Wow. So, so, so beautiful. Oh gosh. So beautiful. Thank you. One of the things that I'm obsessed with 
is just how mythological everybody is. Thank you for saying that. We want to extend a huge thank you to Freedom Mom and Dame for bringing this episode of What's Underneath Birth and Postpartum to Life. Freedom Mom is a company dedicated to demystifying the raw realities of motherhood and prepping moms with the tools they need to tackle pregnancy, postpartum, and breastfeeding. Freedom Mom is rewriting the narrative that talking about your postpartum experience is taboo and is supporting moms around the world to feel empowered in their motherhood journey. New mothers deserve to have access to solutions, tools, and information to get the most out of their postpartum experience. Freedom Mom is now introducing their C-section postpartum recovery line with innovative solutions so that you can prep for the planned and unplanned, get better sooner, and feel stronger. Mom? Yes, Liz? Did you know that women are four times more likely than men to say that sex has not been pleasurable for them at all in the last year? I am not surprised at all and would think that the number would actually be higher. That's where Dame comes in, a leading sexual wellness company that's creating game-changing pleasure products for people with vulvas to help bring your coupled or solo play to the next level. Being a mother has shown me the importance of drawing boundaries and getting my needs met. The most important lesson of all is that when you're happy, your kids are happy. All Dame products are thoughtfully engineered and are designed for you so that you can bring your solo or coupled play to the next level. Because new parents deserve to feel sexy too. Right, Mom? Yes, absolutely, Lils. <laughs> If you're interested in getting Dame today, use code STYLE like you to get 15% off your first order. Make sure to check out your target circle for some money off of Freedom Mom's newest pregnancy and C-section line. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of What's Underneath with Bishop. For more episodes like this, you can subscribe to Style Like You. And for the extended cut of Bishop's episode, you can find it on Style Like You's Patreon. Say okay. bye. <laughs>